Turn to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 5. We're going to pick it up where we left off last week. So we're going to start in verse 12. But while you're turning there, I just want to give you a very brief uh, kind of a outline or overview kind of thing. It's important when we read the book of Ecclesiastes, really important that we understand the context of what's being said here and what's going on. Because if we don't, we will have a tendency to quote the book of Ecclesiastes in the wrong way. And if we do that, we'll be joining many atheists who happen to love this book. This is their favorite book. They quote this book because they don't realize that Solomon is speaking about life under the sun. What does that mean? He's speaking about life, what it's like without God. If there's no resurrection from the dead, if there's no life beyond the grave, if there's no Jesus Christ, if there's no Holy Spirit, if there's no God the Father, this is what life looks like. So the... The experiment, if you will, that Solomon is doing, he actually went about and did this. We've talked about that. And he's hitting on all these different areas of life that people often set out to explore in order to find meaning in life. So generally, I think generally, most people start off in life looking to something in the world to be the answer until they find out that there's actually more to life than what we see, touch, smell, feel, and taste. There's actually a reality beyond the physical and the material that's actually a more of a reality than anything that we can see in this world. So I would like to ask you a question before we get started. And it's this. Is your life as a Christian, if you're a Christian, is it any different than if you weren't a Christian? And how does that look? How is your life different because you're a Christian by the way you actually live your life? See, Solomon, the writer of our book, he was pointing out how people live without God. And as we look at that, you will find, get this, this is the other foot dropping. Get this. Many pastors of our day will teach just like Solomon's teaching and they will teach almost to the point to where they are teaching you that this world is all there is and this world is what you should live for. That you should be going after riches because God wants you to be rich. And God wants you to be healthy. And God doesn't want you to suffer. And God doesn't want you to have sickness. And they will teach these things. And these are the most popular preachers in the world these days. People flock to them. And they're teaching and writing books And they're talking about life under the sun as if that's it. But see, a Christian, we should be able to read the book of Ecclesiastes. And as a Christian, we should realize, as Solomon did, 
that everything in this world without God is vanity. Not just vanity, it's vanity of vanities. Let's take it to a whole nother level. It's vanity of vanity, vanities. It's empty of empty. But here's the thing. Here's what I want you to think about. Another thing to think about. So if we're reading the book of Ecclesiastes, we're studying it, we realize life under the sun is empty without God. And then we see that Jesus said, I've come to give you life and that more abundantly. Then I want to ask you, because you're a Christian, is your life so different that the way you're living this life out is with this fullness of God in your heart? So that even though the world under the sun is vanity, but for you, there's life. There's living torrents of water flowing from you. Are you on fire for the Lord? Honestly, ask yourself, am I hot? Am I cold or am I lukewarm right now? Honestly, how do you know that you're on fire? How do you know that you're passionate, that you're following the Lord? How do you know you're not lukewarm? You know the biggest danger of being lukewarm? You have just enough of Jesus not to realize you're lukewarm. That's pretty scary. Usually, probably, a lukewarm person won't know they're lukewarm. They may think they're on fire and they're totally lukewarm. <coughs> but if you're cold tonight, you know you're cold. Book of Revelation tells us that. It's better if you're cold because you know, I'm cold, man. I'm just, I don't, I'm not passionate. I'm not on fire. I know that. Well, there's help for you. You could be helped. But if you're lukewarm, you think, I'm good. I'm on fire. I'm good. So here's a little, just a little test or some things to be thinking about. If you're lukewarm because you don't think you are, then think about this. This will help you a little bit. Here's a few things the Bible says about someone who's on fire. Ask yourself, do you love reading the Word? Did you know if you're lukewarm, not be into the Word too much? You'll be a minimalist. Got a little, little Word just a little bit. If you're on fire, you can't get enough of the word. And you don't just need a pastor or somebody feeding you the word. You're feeding yourself. Why? You can't get enough. You're on fire. Right? So, you know, just to think about it another way, in a, just a secular type of way to think about it, like, if there's a, if there's a food item that you're super excited about, like maybe today you worked on it all day to get it ready and tonight you're going to eat it. You're excited about that. After church, boom, you can't wait to get home. Or if you drove in today and you notice on the Brahms sign, they had a bacon cheeseburger for $6.99. It sounds terrible to me at Brahms, but... If you're into that, you're thinking, man, did you see that sign? I'm so excited. See, if you're on fire for the Lord, one of the best tests is going to be what relationship do you have with the Word of God? Another thing is if you're on fire for the Lord, God is so good to you that you want to tell people about it. Are you sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with people? When you're lukewarm, you don't care that much about that. When you're lukewarm, you'd rather not share the gospel. When you're lukewarm, 
the good news, the gospel, the good news is okay news. It's okay. I'm glad I'm saved, but it's not so amazing. I have to tell people about it. If you're on fire for the Lord, you want to share it. You know when something amazing happens to you? You want to tell people about it, right? But something amazing happens. You can't wait to tell people about it because it's so amazing. But with the gospel, the gospel is not only so amazing that other people can freely partake of it too. So if you want a billion dollars in the lottery and then you knew the numbers and you can tell other people and they can win it too, you would tell those you cared about, hey, you can win it too because you'd be excited about it. You'd want to help people, those sort of things. So another gauge is do you pray about? Are you excited about? Are you burdened? Are you passionate about sharing the gospel? So, the Word of God, your relationship with the Word of God, your relationship to the gospel. Another thing to think about is prayer. Are you on fire to pray? To pray in your closet, metaphorically speaking? to pray with your family, to pray with your friends, to pray with your church, to pray, pray, pray with all prayers and all supplications, making prayers. Are you excited about that? Does that excite you? That's another test. So hopefully you're not finding yourself, I think I'm lukewarm. I'm not passing a lot of these tests. Well, that's good because now you've moved from lukewarm to cold. Now we could do something. Another thing, number four. So we have what? The word, relationship with the word, the relationship with the gospel, relationship with prayer. Third thing, how passionate and excited are you to serve? To serve. To stir up your gift, your spiritual gift, to do something for the Lord, no matter how little or how big you want to do something for the Lord. And I want to serve, whatever that is. If, if it's giving a cup of cold water to somebody, if it's taking somebody after church and saying, hey, can I pray for you? If it's noticing somebody is needy and you say hey I have an extra jacket I notice your jacket is full of holes can I give this to you or I've noticed your pants are dirty and you didn't get them from Nordstrom like that <laughs> if you know what I mean Nordstrom selling jeans for $435 that look dirty it's a new trend hey don't laugh we used to laugh at the holy jeans now a lot of us are wearing those. <laughs> Remember that? We said, oh, how, who would buy those? You just rip them yourself. Well, we buy those now. So, I forgot where I was going with that. So, <laughs> stirring up your gift, using your gift. We can go on and on. I just want to do one more thing, one more thing. Are you on fire? Are you cold? Are you hot for the Lord? The last thing is, do you hunger and thirst for righteousness? How important is righteousness to you? Is that important? The Apostle Paul in the book of Acts, he said, you haven't yet in resisting sin shed blood to resist sin. If we're on fire for the Lord, we're gonna, we want to be righteous so much. We want to walk in a certain way like Jesus walked. We want that. And how easy it is for us to easily accept sinful behavior and activities. And I'm not, I'm not saying that any of us are perfect because we know we're not. But how much do we want to strive to be walking with the Lord? 
and how, how much do we actually take practical steps to walk with the Lord in the way He wants us to walk? So those are a few things. So now, again, I ask you the question, are you on fire for the Lord? Or are you lukewarm? Or maybe now you're cold? I want to look at just another thing. So the Bible says that if you're a Christian, you're, but you've been given the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is inside of you as a, as a Christian. And then it says that the fruit of the Spirit is love. So number one, if you're on fire for the Lord, there's going to be love. Love is going to be coming in you, experienced by you, and flowing through you. Amen. You're going to love because that's what the Holy Spirit's doing. So a lot of times we find ourselves in desert places. We find ourselves dry. We find ourselves maybe going through and doing the things that we should, we think we know we're supposed to do as Christians, but we're missing something. It could be that we're harboring bitterness, unforgiveness, and we can't figure out why we're not on fire, why we're so dry, why we're so barren, why we feel like we're just going through the motions. And it's possible that we're harboring some sort of unforgiveness. And that, that's something that's easily overlooked. Why? It's easy, easily overlooked because we can still do Christian stuff without love. We can still sit here. The Bible says, hey, don't come to the altar bringing, bringing gift to God if you have all this anger and bitterness, I'm paraphrasing, towards people, and then you're acting like you're all good with God. It doesn't work. Our hearts must be free from bitterness and un unforgiveness. Otherwise, we're quenching the Spirit. Amen. If we quench the Spirit, then the only way that we love like Jesus and have that is the Holy Spirit working through us. The fruit of the Spirit is its love. But you know, we all know that's hard because we get challenged all the time in that regard. We get slighted, we get offended, we get hurt, and then, and then our hearts, a hurt heart has a tendency to close up. And then we have these, this example of Jesus and how He was hurt, and He'd say things like, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And we get these things about um, you know, how much should we forgive once or twice, a couple times, 70 times 7 times. How, how much is that? It's we just, we forgive. And forgiveness sets our heart right with God. That's what's so important. And that's why that we can be challenged in that area so much. Just a couple more. So how's your love? Number two, how's your joy? The fruit of the Spirit is love and then it's joy. How's your joy? Joy really is the experience of God's love in our heart. That's what happens. We experience God's love in our heart, and then we have joy. Is joy important for the Christian? Well, it's a fruit of the Spirit. Sometimes we think being somber is a fruit of the Spirit. It's not. Joy is, and the joy of the Lord is our strength so how's your joy and then uh, one I'll actually give you two more one the third thing is how's your peace are you at peace in your heart fruit of the spirit is love joy peace peace is that calming tranquility of the Holy Spirit being in control of our life Knowing because of God's love 
that God has everything in control of us. We have peace. Now I'm just going to give you one more checklist, lukewarm checklist, and that is self-control. Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, goodness. Not in that particular order, but I think they're all in there. But self-control. Are we able to say no? No to the things of sin and the flesh. The Holy Spirit gives us the power to say no. Amen. And sometimes we, we look for some, something to help us say no. And that's a substitute. We can substitute the power of the Holy Spirit that helps us to say no. Help us to say no to sin and the things of the flesh. So with all that, there's actually, uh, th I'm going somewhere with this because as we look at Ecclesiastes, Solomon is basically, he's talking about life without God. And as Christians, our life because of God should be so different than, than the way people live their life in the world. And yet so often we can live as what I would call a practical atheist. Oh, sure, you've received Christ, you're forgiven, you're going to heaven, but then you live your life on your own, as if God doesn't exist. And then we end up looking just like the world, like Solomon saying. This is what people in the world do. And yet, we have the power of the Holy Spirit, get this, the same power that rose Jesus from the dead, we have that inside of us. Amen. And if our life looks like the world's, what is that? We've been rescued, saved, redeemed, and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And that's why we're told to be salt and light. Different. We're called out to be separate. Called out ones. That's exactly what the word, the Greek word for church means called out ones. So with that in mind, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, and I hope as you, as we talked about that, I hope you did, that you would understand that my intention is that you at least be aware of where your walk is. So you can have everything that God wants to have for you. That's, that's, what, that's what I was praying for myself. I went through that checklist myself. And I asked myself, am I on fire? Am I going in the right direction? And there are some things I had to repent of. There are some things I had to say, you know, I'm not quite where I want to be. There's some wilderness areas in my life and I had to repent of those things. And God is so good. Do you know what the Christian's bar of soap is? Anybody? Anyone want to guess? Nice. Very good. 1 John 1.9 1 John 1.9 Christian's bar of soap. Spiritual washing. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Amen. And that, that's for a believer. That's not for salvation, right? To, to be saved, we have to confess our sins, admit we're a sinner and receive salvation. But as we walk in this world as believers, it's important to keep a short account with God. You know what I mean? It's like my dog Lucy doesn't like to be washed. She's an English bulldog. She really doesn't like to be washed. So I have to put her on a leash and I can't even let any slack in there. I have to get it really tight. Keep her on a short lease. Because she tries to go. Get away. As soon as I start squirting her, she tries to go. But see, we need to keep our relationship with God. Have a short account. And not let our life get so far out of bounds that we lose sight completely of who God is. So it's, it's good to, as a psalmist in Psalm 139, 
Search my heart, O Lord, that I may know of any unclean thing or wicked thing in me, that, that we would pray, Lord, am I off? Am I wrong? My attitudes, my idols, my thing. What is, search my heart, Lord. And then as he searches our heart, we confess our sin. That word confess, 1 John 1, 9, Christians bar of soap, right? You know that one now. Amen. Confess means to agree with. If we confess our sin, if we agree with, we say, oh, Lord, I'm, that's not right. I, that's wrong. That's hard for us to say, right? That's wrong. That little lie, that little attitude, that little disrespect of that person, that gossip, that anger in my heart, whatever it is. We confess, we say, Lord, I'm sorry, that's wrong. And he is faithful and just by his blood to wash us and cleanse us of that sin. So we keep our hearts clean. We keep our hearts pure. Solomon is getting to that point. But like many of us, he's going through trying pleasure, trying education, trying building projects, trying new things, all these things he's trying to find. Is there anything in this world that can bring me satisfaction, la lasting satisfaction? Is there anything? And he's looking under every rock. He's turning every corner. He's experimenting with everything, every aspect of life. And as of yet, he hasn't found it. Still vanity. So maybe he will. You think he will? Maybe he'll find something under the sun. Doubt it, though. I read the whole book, so... He doesn't, he doesn't find it, but let's just work, work towards that end. So, verse 12, chapter 5, grab your Bibles with that brief introduction. So now he says this. He says, the sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eats a little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not per permit him to sleep. So he's speaking from experience. He had more money than anybody on the planet at that time. And possibly, possibly he was the richest man that, that ever lived, if you equated it out. I don't know that for sure, but probably he was the richest, richest man that ever lived. And what he's saying is that what some of us value, or let me put it this way, what a person in this world values is currency, money, value. That's one of the biggest things that a person in the world values, right? Money. Why? It's not so much the money, like... Nobody just enjoys having a $20 bill, just that. It's what that $20 bill can do for them. So that money, that, say, $20 bill, it represents an ability to do what the heart wants to do. If you have an unlimited amount of those $20, then you have an unlimited amount of ability to do whatever your heart wants to do. Now, the Bible says money is the root of all evil. It's interesting. If you love money, you know that you have a root of evil in you. If you love money. So we know money throughout the history of mankind has been the, the thing that men worship. Why? Because men ultimately without God worship themselves. In the book of Revelation, pretty soon we're going to get there, and it says the mark of the beast is what? Anybody? The mark of the beast is the number, what's the number? 666. 
and it's the number of man. So humanism, life on earth without God, secular life as you will, human life, it's the mark of man. It's man-centered. So it's man-centered. So that's why when Jesus died on the cross for our sins, he broke the bondage and the chains that we have about having ourselves in the center. And that's why he says, if you want to follow Jesus, you have to take up your cross and deny yourself and follow him. Did you know that the Satanist manifesto, in the Satanist manifesto, their slogan or creed is, do what thou wilt. That's what Satan, Satanists, if you're a Satanist... A true Satanist is really a humanist. So if, you, if you're in that, I know none of you are here, but people who are Satanists, they're humanists, meaning they don't want any restrictions on the impulses of their flesh. They want to do whatever they want to do, and they don't want anybody to tell them not to do that. That's the number of the mark of the beast. But can you see that when a Christian is not living under the power of the Holy Spirit, but is driven by the flesh, Satan is getting a foothold in somebody's life. And this goes right back to the sin of the very beginning, goes right back to the Babylonian religions, goes back right back to the idols that they would worship. And so it's the seducing spirits that the Bible tells us that attach themselves or fix themselves to the desires of men, whatever the desires of men, whenever we put something in the place of God, that's an idol. Whether it occupies a majority of our interest, our joy, our time, where we look for it, look to something else for satisfaction, for happiness, for fulfillment, or just passing the time. Well, now we've, we've fallen into, that's an idol. And when we have a preoccupation with something that's not of the Lord, then these seducing spirits have a tendency to pull us into their trap. That's why there's such power that the Holy Spirit gives us in the power of self-control, that we can say no to the things of the fr flesh. And we can say no to the things of the flesh, not by our willpower, which a lot of times we make that mistake as Christians. Paul told the Galatians the same type of thing. He said, basically, you know, what, what's gotten off in the wrong direction that you think you can receive the Holy Spirit by faith, but then you think you can live your life out as a Christian by living by the law, by living by works. And that's often what we do is we try to fight these battles of the flesh with willpower. And we find out that willpower is won't power. Willpower is not enough to overcome the power of sin and the flesh. Only the power of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so the Bible says to walk in the Spirit so you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. So that means that when we're walking in the Spirit, we don't, we're not even battling sin. Because we're walking in the Spirit. But when we start to turn to the left, turn to the right, look behind us, we start to get away from the things of the Spirit, you'll notice the struggle start to happen. But when we're walking in the Spirit, it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's the kingdom of God inside of us. Righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. So what, this, what the, the enemy does, what Satan does, is he tries to tempt us to turn to the left, turn to the right, or turn behind. Because now, 
Now he can start pulling us. But if we stay in the Spirit, we're in the power of the Spirit. Our eyes are on Christ. We're rejoicing in the Lord. We're thankful. We're in the Word. We're meditating on the Word. We're praying. And we're walking with Jesus. Then we're just filled with the fruit of the Spirit. We're filled with righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. But as we see in our text, money, the thing that people crave so much, for a believer, God actually limits at times currency to keep us on the straight and narrow. Because for a lot of people, if they were given too much money, now they would have the ability to do the things that the flesh wants them to do. But when we don't have money, sometimes God uses money to prevent us from completely going off the deep end. So don't pray to be rich. It's okay. Don't pray to be poor either. Pray that you have enough. And pray that your heart, most importantly, is what? Content. The Bible says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. Why do people crave money so much? It's because of the tenth commandment is what covetousness. I want, I want, I want. I have to have, I have to, I see it, I want it. That would be great. That, and our hearts just want, what's the answer, answer to that? We have to get back to being satisfied in the Lord. Satisfied in the Lord. So, we're not going to get very far tonight. So verse 13. Now he's, he's saying, and this kind of all goes together with this uh, materialistic idea. He says, there's a severe evil which I have seen. There's the term under the sun. You see that? He says, riches kept for their owner to his hurt. But those riches perish through misfortune. And when he begets a son, there is nothing in his hand. So he's talking about how frail riches are. And how the accumulation of wealth will never be anything that anybody can totally hang their hat on. Because a lot of people in 2008, they lost all of their savings in the real estate market. Other people lost money through the various um, stock market plunges and crashes. And usually it's because of a desire to be rich. And the Bible says whoever has a desire to be rich falls into a snare. So right there, if our heart, we want to be rich, we're all, we're going to be trapped. You can't get around that. So he's talking about somebody who they think the end is going to be rich and I can pass it on to my children. And yet then misfortune hits and everything that they've built their life on goes away. They have nothing for their children to pass down, and he says in verse 15, and he says, As he came from his mother's womb, naked he shall return to go as he came, and he shall not take, or he shall take nothing from his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. And this is also a severe evil. Just exactly as he came, so shall he go. And what profit has he who has labored for the wind? It's an interesting way to look at it, huh? You're laboring for the wind. It says, all his days he also eats in darkness, and he has so much sorrow and sickness and anger. So this is... This is this picture that Solomon's seeing is a lost fortune. And imagine building your life 
on the accumulation of wealth and one having all that go away, which has happened. And wealth at the end of the day is really not something that anybody totally can control. If you have a lot of money, are you going to trust the bank? People in Greece did and lost all their money. And that's just one example. But, do, you know, if your money is in the bank, do you really know you have that money? So susceptible. If it's in the stock, like, what do you do with it? If you, if you have a lot of money, where, do you, where can you put your money to where you feel like that'll never go away again? There's not a place on earth. And many a man and woman has, have lost their fortune. So he's saying you can't build your life on it. You can't make that the thing because it can go away. And in many cases it does, especially if you don't have a biblical mindset about your money and you're trying to get rich quick, which the Bible speaks against. And many of those people have put their money in unsafe investments and lost it all. Maybe they had a, a, a spike in accumulation and then they lost it all. So that's empty, he's saying. That's, that's terrible. But at the end of the day, if you keep all your money, you're not taking it with you to heaven. That's going to do you no good in heaven. Faith is the currency of heaven. Faith is like heaven's money. Here we use dollar bills. There we use faith. But that's why the Bible says that we live by faith now. That's the currency of heaven. And we trust God for our resources. So in verse 18, now he says, he says, here's what I have seen. So he's really into this, just checking things out. He said, it, it's good and fitting for one to eat and drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor in which he toils under the sun. There's that term again. All the days of his life, which God gives him, for it is his heritage. So after, after all that, remember now he's saying, under the sun, the best you can do is just work, 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 and then just try to enjoy the stuff from working. That's, that's life. That's how life goes. Sun comes up, sun goes down. Go to work. You come home and those things add up fast, right? Those things go really fast. If you're getting a little older, you realize what happened? What happened? My daughter is going to graduate from college in a couple weeks. And it, I, it seemed like I just put her on the plane. I cannot believe it's been four years. Mind blowing. But that's how life is. So he says in verse 19, he says, As for every man whom God has given riches and wealth. Notice God gives that. And given him power to eat it. That's interesting. So if God blesses someone with wealth, it's a whole nother blessing that they can actually enjoy it. What he's saying is a lot of people have wealth, but don't enjoy it. I think I pointed out last week that um, J.D. Rockefeller, one of the richest men that ever lived in the, the last several years of his life, he couldn't even enjoy anything. He was, uh, his stomach was so messed up from ulcers and stress that he couldn't eat any good food. He had to eat like oatmeal and mush type of stuff all the time. So all that stress from all that money. But a lot of you may remember Howard Hughes, another very rich man. He was just so rich, he became so uh, eccentric and odd and weird and nobody wanted to hang out with just a weird dude. His money made him so weird. 
So he wasn't rich in the things of God, which is the most important things. So he says, if you have power to have, if God's given you power to make money and he's given you the power to enjoy it, he says, to receive his heritage and rejoice in his labor, that's a gift of God. So what he's saying is, if there's nothing else except for what's under the sun and you have some stuff and you are just, just try to enjoy that. That's the best you can do. You don't have anything else to look for or hope for. So just try to enjoy that. That sounds pretty sad, doesn't it? It's like, but you know, I think that's, that's how a lot of people end up being Christians is because they find out that, is that it? It's just, you just work and maybe have a family and then, and then that's it. Is there anything beyond that? I think a lot of people wake up at that point. In verse 20, he says, For he will not dwell unduly on the days of his life because God keeps him busy with the joy of his heart. That's interesting because what he's saying is if, if you've been blessed with some good fortune financially and you can just enjoy it, then God, he says, God will keep you busy with those things so you don't have to think about the days of your life. You know how, how that's what a lot of people do is they, uh, it's escapism. Anything so I don't have to think about the dailiness of daily life. Do you ever feel like life is, life is just so daily? You know, it's just so routine. And, and so if you have something that God has blessed you with so you don't have to think about how mundane and daily life is, then you're really fortunate. But remember, he's just speaking about life under the sun. So we do have time to go into chapter 6. And this is a fairly quick chapter. It really is. And... This chapter then is speaking about, you know, kind of those who have this idea of the American dream. Like, what, think about what you would picture with the American dream. Usually people think about just being able to use the opportunities of democracy and capitalism to have a comfortable and successful existence. That's kind of how people think. So he says this, he goes, there's an evil, another evil, which I've seen under the sun. There it is, under the sun. And this is common among men. And this is, this is it. He says, a man to whom God has given riches and wealth and honor, that he lacks nothing for himself of all he desires, yet... God does not give him the power to eat of it, but for or a foreigner consumes it. This is vanity, and it is an evil affliction. So basically what he's talking about is someone who sets out to be successful and have a career and actually does that, but they can't enjoy it. And it seems like that's the most common scenario for someone who's rich or wealthy or done well. Life under the sun, it's always a trade-off, isn't it? If you give yourself to success and working hard and accumulation of wealth, then a good possibility is you've sacrificed other things in your life. Maybe your family never sees you, or maybe you're traveling all the time. Maybe you don't get to hang out with your kids or something. But what he's saying is there's another evil I see, and it's just this imbalance. You can't have it all. You really can't have it all. And uh, accumulation in one end is a subtraction in another end. And so what we do in life under the sun it's always this balance of trying to find the right balance between, you know, having enough for my family and spending enough time 
with my family or whatever that may be. That's what he's saying. See, that's another frustration and another evil. And then in verse three, he says, if a man begets a hundred children and lives many years so that the days of his years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with goodness or indeed he has no burial, I say that a stillborn child is better than he. So what he's pointing out, and unfortunately you don't think about children as well as they did in those days, but children were seen as a blessing. So the more children you have, the more blessed you are. Now, some people don't quite see children as much as a blessing in our society because why it's a balance of if I have children that's going to take away from what I have so we don't see it like that but in it was an uh, agricultural society so more children meant more workers and more production in the field so you wouldn't have to pay people you'd have a bigger family and they do all the work so children were like you know, a blessing. So the more children you had, the more. Now it's like children take away from, so we don't see it as much. What, 2.1 average children or whatever. So what he's saying is, if you have all this stuff and at your funeral, he's talking about a funeral where nobody shows up. And he's, he's saying, whatever you accomplish, but your soul's not satisfied, what good is that? What good is that if your soul is not satisfied? So you have that $20 bill and you can buy something you want, but what you're buying is not going to bring love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. $20 can't buy that, right? But that's what we think. We, the, for most people that don't understand the things of the Spirit, they think... That $20 will bring them satisfaction. And it might bring a temporary, a momentary feeling of satisfaction, but it all goes away, doesn't it? So that $20, you spend it at in and out it's great. The next morning you wake up, you're hungry again, right? It's not satisfying. So that's what he's saying. And this is such a cosmic shift of a paradigm that Christians don't live by physical bread alone, but by every word that comes out of God's mouth. It speaks of satisfaction. And the world is desperately looking for their souls to be satisfied. And if you're a Christian, you are so rich in God having the Holy Spirit inside of you, what money will buy that? And how many times do we not appreciate that we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us? That we have the living God inside of us and that's all we need. We have, we have it all. And so for the Christian to strive after money and fame and power and to live like we don't have the Holy Spirit is to not understand the power of God that lives inside of us. So he says in verse four, he says, for it comes in vanity and departs in darkness and its name is covered with darkness. Though it has not seen the sun, or known anything, this has more rest than that man. So he says, even if he lives a thousand years twice, but has not seen goodness, do not all go to one place? Verse 7, all the labor of a man is for his mouth, his food, and yet the soul is not satisfied. This, that statement, can you imagine what Hollywood would look like? What 
famous athletes, what famous musicians would look like, if they would just read that verse and realize fame, fortune, relationships, pleasure, all that, it won't touch your soul. We can tell a person, you can tell your kids, your friends, your family, you can do all those things. They won't do a thing to satisfy your soul. And how many of us have experienced that and experimented with that? And we know something out here cannot satisfy that within there. Something physical, material, and temporary has no effect on our souls that are spiritual. And that's the amazing thing about the gospel. Guys, do you know the world is craving for satisfaction? They're craving for belonging, for goodness, for something desperately, and we have that. We have that in Jesus Christ. So finishing up in verse 8, he says, For what more has the wise man than the fool? What does the poor man have who knows how to walk before the living? He says, better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of a desire. This also is vanity and grasping for the wind. Do you see what he's saying in verse 9? Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of a desire. You know what that means? Have you lived your life thinking, when this happens, then I'll be happy. When I get here, when I get that, when that, what he's saying is what you have, what you have is better than a wandering desire. And isn't it a shame I point my finger to myself. How much of my life I live with wandering desires. As soon as I get that, as soon as I have that, as soon as I accomplish that. Guys, if you're a Christian, there's nothing else. You have it all in Jesus Christ. Every circumstance and uh, accomplishment and achievement, that has no bearing on the satisfaction of your soul. And you know what? If you're fortunate enough to achieve something that you set out to achieve or you have a dream and you went and you accomplished a dream, when you get there, it's going to be empty if it's not the Lord. When you get there, it's not going to be satisfying if it's not your satisfaction that you're having in the Lord. It's all empty. Highlight that verse. Mark that verse. Because what we have now is the best. Whatever it is, materially, positionally, where we're at in life, everything else, if we seek God in it, if we find God in it, if we praise God, worship God, enjoy God in it, it, it's not something that's out there. It's something that's in here. Better is the sight of the eyes than a wandering desire. This also is vanity. Verse 10, whatever one is... He has been named already. For it is known that he is man, and he cannot contend with him who is mightier than he. Since there are many things that increase vanity, how is man the better? You know what he's saying? He's saying God is sovereign. God has a plan. And when we don't join what God has already set out, it's just a constant struggle of dissatisfaction. Do you get that? That is so crucial. Because we can't change God's sovereign plan. And so... What we do is we wrestle with God. There's friction, there's fighting, there's discontentment until the point where we realize God's not going to change to me. I need to change to him. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says, 
that he is pre, or how does it go, that he is um, foreordained good works that we should walk in them. Our job is just to walk in what God has. And so often we say, I, I can't, I'm, I'm a Christian, but I can't, I can't find peace and rest in that fullness and the satisfaction. Well, it might be because we haven't accepted what God's doing in our life and then just walked with God and said, thank you, Lord. But we're trying to do something other than God's plan or be something other than God has for us instead of just resting in what God's doing. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, want, we want, we want, we want, and we're not satisfied. Instead, God has a better plan. He says, I have, I have, I have. Join in with what I have and rest in that. Enjoy that. That's where you find satisfaction. And then finishing up, for who knows what is good for man in life? That's interesting, isn't it? We think we know what's best for us. There are so many things I thought was best for me. And most of those things I was wrong. For who knows what is good for man in life? All the days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow, who can tell a man what will happen after him under the sun? The whole point is, none of us know what tomorrow holds, but we know the one who holds tomorrow. Much better to let the one who holds tomorrow hold us and let him carry out and work out his plan in our life, and we get to enjoy the ride knowing that God promises to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all we can ask or think. His plan's way better than ours. His ways, Isaiah 55, are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So just relax, find joy, contentment, and satisfaction in the Lord. Keep things simple and be on fire for Him. Amen? One more chapter.